A reading from the book of Exodus. In those days God delivered all these commandments. I, the Lord, am your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, that place of slavery. You shall not have other gods besides me. You shall not carve idols for yourselves in the shape of anything in the sky above or on the earth below or in the waters beneath the earth. You shall not bow down before them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, inflicting punishment for their father's wickedness on the children of those who hate me down to the third and fourth generation, but bestowing mercy down to the thousandth generation on the children of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave unpunished the one who takes his name in vain. Remember to keep holy the Sabbath day. Six days you may labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. No work may be done then, either by you or your son or daughter or your male or female slave or your beast or by the alien who lives with you. In six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but on the seventh day he rested. That is why the Lord has blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that you may have a long life in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife nor his male or female slave, nor his ox or ass, nor anything else that belongs to him. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord, you have the words of everlasting life. Lord, you have the words of everlasting life. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The decree of the Lord is trustworthy, giving wisdom to the simple. Lord, you have the words of everlasting life. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The command of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eye. Lord, you have the words of everlasting life. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinance of the, of the Lord are true, and all of them just. Lord, you have the words of everlasting life. They are more precious than gold, than a heap of purest gold, sweeter also than syrup or honey from the comb. Lord, you have the words of everlasting life. A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, Jews and Greeks alike, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Praise and honor to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Praise and honor to you, Lord Jesus Christ. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him might have eternal life. Praise and honor to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Since the Passover of the Jews was near, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. He found in the temple area those who sold oxen, sheep, and doves, as well as the money changers seated there. He made a whip out of cords 
and drove them all out of the temple area with the sheep and oxen, and spilled the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who sold doves he said, Take these out of here, and stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples recalled the words of Scripture, Zeal for your house will consume me. At this the Jews answered and said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. Therefore, when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they came to believe the scripture and the words Jesus had spoken. While he was in Jerusalem for the feast of Passover, many began to believe in his name when they saw the signs he was doing. But Jesus would not trust himself to them, because he knew them all and did not need anyone to testify about human nature. He himself understood it well. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. He gives us the commandments. And Lord, you have the words of everlasting life. Do you know why it's so refreshing to us, so heartening to our minds and souls when we hear the words of God's commandments? We who have the Spirit of God, we are not cast down or discouraged when we hear the commandments. We do not groan and look at it as some oppressive burden when we hear what God requires of us, when we learn the moral law. The reason it refreshes our spirit is that we were made according to the Word. Remember how God made the universe. He spoke a Word. That Word, of course, is Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Through Him all things were made. Everything was made for Christ, through Christ, in Christ. And we were made by His Word. So the Word of God, is, it's in our DNA. It's how we're structured. It's the, it's the fit. It's the perfect fit for human life, for human happiness, for human community, for human fulfillment. And so, of course, we rejoice. You have the words, Lord, of everlasting life. My soul is refreshed when I hear your commands. They are sweeter than honey from the comb. Because we're made that way. We hear the Word and we say, ah, that's who we are. That's who I am. That's the way to happiness and fulfillment. We can look at what's going on around us in the culture of death. We can look at the sick, demented philosophies of those who push things like abortion. We can look at some of the bills that are introduced in these days in the Democrat Congress. And it's disgusting. It's sickening. And those are not the words of everlasting life that come to us from the Lord. Those are the words of everlasting death. The sick and immoral policies that the Democrats try to push on us. Expanding, just as one example, more and more baby killing. The words of everlasting death. They distress us. And the reason they distress us is that because... They, they, they are completely contrary to how we are made. They go against every good and natural instinct in the human person. And there's a battle. The battle is on between those who believe in, live, and advance the commandments of God, which are the commandments of life, and those who push the agenda of death. And this is a battle, brothers and sisters, that we understand how to live and how to fight by probing more deeply into this saying of Jesus in today's gospel. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The temple 
was constructed, the temple there in Jerusalem, which had in it the Holy of Holies, which was constructed, as we read in the Old Testament, under the very specific commands of God. He described exactly how it should be made. This was a foreshadowing of Christ. The temple itself was a foreshadowing of Christ and the church. Because he is the living temple. He was speaking of the temple of his body. But it wasn't disconnected from that temple that was there because that temple that was there was there as a prophecy of him. Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. It was the forces of death that conspired against Christ. The forces of wickedness, evil, lies, and murder. The same forces at work in the Democrat Party and in the culture of death. The same, cult- the same dynamics at work in genocidal political parties and programs that have marred human history throughout the centuries. These are the forces that conspired against Jesus Christ and brought him to the cross. And he was raised precisely to counteract the forces of falsehood and death and corruption. He was raised precisely to counteract that. But the temple now of his body, gloriously risen from the dead, is the temple also of the church. In other words, all of us baptized and now during Lent those preparing to be baptized at Easter, the catechumens of the church, by that power of baptism we are incorporated into that living temple which is the body of Christ. Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up and then I will continue to build it As more and more members are added to the church, more and more living members are added to the body. St. Paul talks beautifully in the New Testament about the church as the body of Christ and we, individually members of it with Christ as the head. There are two other images. The living temple, Peter says we are living stones built into this temple. When your church was dedicated, you know, the bricks of the wall were sprinkled with water by the bishop. Each of those bricks represents each of us, living stones connected together in the temple of the church, and the water flowing over the bricks represents the water of baptism flowing over us. We are the living body of Christ. We are the living temple of God, the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. And then we are the branches on the vine. I am the true vine, Jesus said, and you are the branches. Again, the image of a living organism, the whole Christ, if you will. Christ as the head, we as the members. And this living body, temple, vine, lives through the centuries fighting against those forces, the same forces that nailed Christ's body to the cross but could not keep Him in the grave. Same forces... And now it is we fighting against those things. Now, it's not that, you know, we know the difference between right and wrong and we see all kinds of wrong and evil going on in the world. We pray to Jesus, please get rid of the evil. Please help us overcome it. It's not us over here asking Jesus to fight the evil over there. It's deeper than that. We are the body of Christ. We are fighting against that evil together, the head and the members, the vine and the branches, the living temple. We together, this intimate union of the risen Christ with us, the baptized faithful, are fighting against and overcoming that kingdom of death and evil. And we're on a trajectory to the new and eternal Jerusalem where this will be brought to perfect fulfillment. And when we understand where we're going, we understand where we are. Let me go to the last chapters of the Bible, Revelation 21 and 22. John says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Now keep this in mind. We're going to read this with the perspective in mind that I just 
explained, in the light of the words, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Jesus said, I will build my church. It's a constant building. Keep that in mind as we read here now the end point, okay, the fulfillment in that glorious kingdom of heaven. John says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And what did he see? What is this heavenly reality? He says, it's a city. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. And now he's going to shift the image. The city is also a bride. Coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. So who is this bride? We are. The church is the bride of Christ. It's a city. It's a bride. And now we read... Verse 3, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling of God is with people. He will dwell with them, and they shall be His people, and God Himself will be with them. So there's this bridal unity, this marriage between God and His people, this perfect fulfillment of intimate life between God and His people forever in heaven. Again, the one living organism, right? The body of Christ, which we are now, the living vine, the living temple. So that's heaven, this city, this bride, God with His people. And because He is so intimately connected with His people, the passage goes on to say He'll wipe every tear away. and Death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, crying out, or pain. For the former things have passed away. Now, not only will there be no more death, crying out, or pain, there will be no more need for light from lamps or the sun, it goes on to say, because the Lord will give them light. So again, you see this intimacy. All these things we have around us to help us, the sun or these lights that are on right here in this, in this studio chapel, we won't need these, these intermediaries anymore. This so deep, so perfect is the union from God, between God and His people that God Himself is our light. He's our sun. And then there's something else that is not there in the heavenly Jerusalem. And this would have been so astonishing to those who first read it, for whom the temple was so central. Verse 22 of Revelation 21 says, And I saw no temple. In the city. Why not? Because as I said, the temple was a foreshadowing, a prophecy of Christ and his church. Now that that is fulfilled perfectly, it's fulfilled now, it will be fulfilled perfectly in heaven. There's no need anymore for the physical temple. I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. Again, not separate from His people. The whole thrust of these last two chapters of the Bible is, there's this intimate unity of God and His people. In fact, it goes on to say, They shall see His face, we who are in heaven, see His face, and His name shall be on their foreheads. His name shall be on their foreheads. Destroy this temple. And in three days I will raise it up. No power of death, no power of violence, no power of destruction, no power of falsehood, no power of sin is going to be able to overcome Christ and His church, the living temple. And this is the Spirit in which we battle against the evils of our day, starting with the evils within us. Because when we hear the words of those commandments of today's first reading, when we hear all the teachings of Christ, our hearts are not burdened and downcast. They rejoice. They leap with joy. We run in the way of His commandments because it's the Spirit who made us according to that word, that loves, lives and loves in us. Destroy this temple. And in three days I will rebuild it. 
and I will keep building it. And my people will be coming into this living temple, and we will overcome all evil. And in that new Jerusalem, there will be no temple in the city because we will be the temple. We will be the temple, as we are even now. What this means, brothers and sisters, is that we've, as we fight in the cultural realm, in the political realm, even in the church, to defend truth, to defend goodness, to defend what is right, we are never cast down. We are never deterred. We don't pause. We don't doubt for a moment. We move forward with the absolute determination and confidence that come from the promise and the life that has already been given to us in that destination of the new and eternal Jerusalem about which we just read. Praise you, Lord Jesus. This is our Lenten journey that we come to such a clear and renewed awareness of who we are in Christ and of the powerful reality of the Paschal mystery that regenerates us and makes us reborn to a new life. We embrace that life this Lent. That's why we give things up and reject sin and do extra fasting and prayer and penance and almsgiving. It's all about this new life. May God bless us. May He bless the catechumens of the church preparing to receive this gift. May He give us great joy now as we continue our journey of life in Christ. Amen.